Okay, somebody had a notification turned on there. That's interesting. So <laughs> thank you for attending Worldwide Slot Card Chat number 58. I'm your host, Greg Gaub. Gang's all here. Petrucci, Steve, Luff, John, Leo, Don, Paul, Martin, Big Den, Marks, Chris, uh, Dr. Ray, and other people. Uh, as always, we will start with some show and tell. And Paul was already showing and telling. So we're going to make Paul repeat his show and tell. So I'm going to focus in on you and you show and tell whatever you want to show and tell, Paul. Well, last time we were talking about the Batmobile. And I said I had a 132nd scale Batmobile. And you're saying, no, nah, it's the one out of the set. It's not. It is an authentic one. Eden says so on the box. Authentic. <laughs> but authentic. But we, yeah. don't, but we don't have a brand or anything? No, I've got nothing... No, it's nothing under there, but it's authentic. it is authentic. <laughs> well, it's a big one. I don't know what it goes right? like, because I've never, never driven it. It's always been in the, in the box put away. It looks like it shows you how old it is. It's going, <laughs> going oh, yellow. Cool. It looked like there was a hole through the side somehow. Is there like open vents or something that? No, it's, I've dropped it and uh, <laughs> oh, okay. the motor's now, listen. Nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it's it's nice on one side, and it's not on that side. <laughs> so um, I think I might have to take it apart and repair it. I was gonna say take it apart and see what you can do, and, yeah. and get that sucker on a track at some point. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's gonna that the width of it and how I mean, say so that is massive. Yeah, it is. Get some decent tires on the back. And uh, let it go. That's the other thing I was playing with, the fly with the new chassis. I've brought a new chassis for it, and it's got the beat, one of my old beta interiors in it. I don't know if you can see. Who makes the chassis? Um, that way, that one's um, an Amato chassis. Probably be on Shapeways. Um, but you can get it either in line or Sidewinder. So... It's um, it does, and that goes like a scaldy cat as well. <laughs> and I haven't even put a long can in it yet, so God knows what it's going to go like with a long can in it. You might, That's you it. might not, you might not have to, Paul. No, I don't think I will because I may say that that earlier when I was testing it, and bearing in mind the track was still dusty, that was still running five second laps. So, and that's got slotted tires on the back, not got NSR rubber on it yet. So I should be taking up to uh, Avon at the weekend and uh, see how it runs up there. Is that a wood track? Yeah, yeah, mine's, mine's a wood track and Avon's one is a wood track as well. It's the old Shepton track. All right, keep the, uh, keep the lightweight short cans in there. Do yourself a favor. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll take that on, Chris. It's it's I mean they're they're great for plastic because they exhibit a lot of downforce on the metal rails, but if you're running on tape or braid, that great big hunk of weight back there exhibits no downforce, obviously on tape or braid, and it's 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 just not great. But it's a hundred percent improvement on the fly, <laughs> complete hundred percent improve. Obviously, the the only thing I, I kept is the uh, is the body, of course. And the front wheels, <laughs> everything else has just gone the interior. I just thought, can I cut it? No, sod it. Bomb. That's gone in the bin as well. So I just, well, usual trick for fly cars, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, the, the flies are the supermodels of slot cars. I can't wait to do the Sanico one. I, I might, uh, at a moment, it's in a, it is in a list to do. I might bump it up or I might just take put this one back on the sonico uh fly chassis and do the strip the body out on the sonico one and race that one but it's got well it's got to be done in it <laughs> i want to see how it handles first that's saturday up because uh shepton's tracks changed and um it's a shorter track and it's got more twists and turns in it so hopefully um that's that should be good um angelo's making 
that should ha that should handle well then. Yeah, yeah, it's got no lead on it whatsoever. Nothing on there whatsoever, and it goes through mine like a like wait, go cuts through my truck like hot knife through par. It's so quick, I can't believe it. It's almost on par with the uh, thunder slot one. And if I have some decent tires on the back, I think it will be um, on par with it. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. That's fine. Uh, and uh, John, you have some show and tell things. Why don't you go ahead and show and tell? Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different thing. I, I was I'm messing about with uh, some scenery stuff. And um, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure we all have these on our track. They're, they're just brilliant pieces of... Uh, of scenery, you know these um, new Ray motorcycles, oh. and they, they make great uh, great items for for uh, for scenery. But you know uh, they don't come with a rider, and I guess you can put a um, a monogram figure beside them, which is okay. But I mean, he's in a driving suit; he's not doesn't really look like a motorcycle rider. So I created um, a motorcyclist figure that was standing and put him beside one, that, that looked okay, but I really wanted to build a rider. So uh, I guess like most of you folks, I have a bag of um, bits of figures and so forth and thought, okay, well, let's see what I can parse together. So I basically put this together, um, some legs, uh, a torso and some arms that I hope would fit the handlebars. And here's what came up with. and it came up really quite nicely. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, yeah. Looks like he's riding around. Yep. Now, what's really now the, the the next step? Of course, I showed our daughter, and she said, "Well, how do we get this to go around the track?" And I thought, "Oh, there's an idea." Any <laughs> any suggestions? No. Okay. I mean, so then I I also was was casting like uh, mad, by the way, and and thought I'd try a new a new color for the three fifty six. So I thought, well, let's try orange, and. My goodness, actually, it looks looks pretty good. And again, that's right out of the mold. That, that's so. I, I guess I could buff it a little more, but yeah, put some blue on it and call it a gold. <laughs> oh, that's good. That. That's an idea. Well, he could put a yellow stripe down the blue one. That too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. But yeah, I was, and that's the that's the tint I was telling you folks about, and it it really does a nice job. Nice. So there you go. That is nice, isn't it? Yeah, it turned out, it turned out quite, quite nicely. Just want some orange stickers on the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep, keep us up to date on the on the figure progress. That that writer looks great. Greg, is it Greg? Well, if, well, if any if anyone's interested, I can certainly make a mold of it. And um, yeah, I, again, I they, they you can adjust the arms so it'll fit different types of new race stuff, but. I just wanted a rider on the Indian because that Indian is such a cool bike. Uh, do you think that? Do you think your driver would fit on this? I'm a little. I got a, I built a go kart track for the. These are little. They're scale of one thirty second. And I can't find. I can't find drivers anywhere. It, it might. It might work. It's worth it. Worth a shot. Um, what, what what type of motor do you have in there? None. They're just. They're just a prop. They're just a scenery. Oh, a little company in Australia makes them. That's really cool. You know, I they, they, actually they are. <laughs> wow. But finding a driver, I mean, it's been tough. I mean, there's one in this one. <laughs> uh, that's that's close. That's close. <laughs> so wow. I wonder if your legs. If your legs are too far apart, is what I'm they, wondering. They might be, yeah, because the tank on the um, Indian motorcycle is really big. Yeah, so I, I, got, to, I had to really make them wide. Um, hmm, maybe I should get. You know, I'll tell you what. Let me let me hunt for those go karts because now I'm thinking those would be really cool, and maybe I can come up with something. Maybe you can mold them in some sort of flexible resin too. And then, uh, actually, or your your thing would your thing would work actually. Yep. That's well, I've tried, I've tried heating and bending some, you know, bending legs on some of them, but it, that just never quite works. Yeah, resin, resin isn't really like a normal styrene plastic. It, it nope. doesn't like to bend with heat. No. Nope. No. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, so that's that, kind of, kind of interesting. Those are really cool. 
I think I saw them around your track when you took us on the tour, and I didn't realize that those were. Yeah. So cool. John, what you need to do is to make a little wire armature that would fit inside the mold, and then you cast it in uh, in resin, and then you can bend the legs and arms any way you like. Actually, that that's you can make like you remember those Gumby and well, you're, I probably remember the Gumby and Pokies with the wires inside that would always break. If you did it in, in urethane, it would work perfectly. That's yeah. a great idea. <laughs> wow! Oh, there's a couple of lost evenings. <laughs> Yeah. It's a couple of, <laughs> couple of lost weeks, weeks, I would think. Yeah, <laughs> a couple of lost weeks. Well, a, new, a new project for John to work on. Does anybody else have any show and tell they want to show and tell about? No, question. Okay, go ahead, Pikachu. What's your Dennis. question? I noticed on the, it wasn't last week, but I watched last week's video and I noticed you've got a Sideway GT, full GTE. Yeah. How comes, how'd you get it so quick? Well, the white kits are released already, so um, <clears throat> we, you know, the, it arrived at the local store where I work, and I happened to be there the day that they arrived, <laughs> so I took one home with me, which was good because we ordered, we ordered, uh, the, the store ordered six of them, and when I came back the following week, uh, they were gone, because I, I took one, and then some other guy called up and took all five of the others, so... Uh, you know, he's obviously more of a painter than I am, but uh, I've got, yeah. I've got two on all now, one with Prendel, Prendel and one was Train and Sluts. And they're yeah, still, I, yeah, still I, on the uh, pro order. The, um, obviously, the, the, um, the delivery to the UK and the delivery to um, the US is some different issue. I, don't, I have no idea how that works. A delivery stuck in the Suez. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. More. Well, Alan, looks like you're ready to show something off. Is that a, a new purchase or something you're working on? This is uh, something I've been working on for quite a while. I think I showed oh, yeah, you yeah. the uh, nice. I showed you the TL7 Scaly Yellow. Uh -huh. uh, so it's going to refurb. So this is uh, the nearly finished product sure. yeah. uh, with its SRC Mini Light wheels. Um, the whole thing came together quite well. Uh, the, um, that, that looks great, Alan. That looks wonderful. Yeah, I like the I like the color scheme. Yeah. Uh, it's a color scheme off an actual rally car. Uh, so mm. you know that was when I was just surfing the internet and I saw that. Um, there were some issues with it. I really like the gunmetal gray. That was the thing mm -hmm. that made me think I, I really like that. Uh, and I managed to do the burgundy body detail work, uh, but the. Um, but the white parts, I mean, the, the, the number is, a, de is a, a slide decal, a water slide white decal, so that's not a problem. But the stripe, that's actually done using um, insulation tape cut really, really thinly with a Stanley knot because uh, nothing, everything else just, just wouldn't give me that bright kind of pop that I was looking for, uh, for the white. You know, everything else, if I made them in water slide, it just seemed to go kind of dirty gray, which wasn't really what I was looking for. So, so far it's had a, it's had a test. Um, it does go really well. That's the, uh, the chassis is a Should, uh, hot rodicus <laughs> slot it, supersonicus HRS2. Um, and I made some modifications to the front balance work on the car. Uh, you can probably see that because I wanted the guide length to be a little longer than the, the main chassis would allow or the, mm -hmm. the, the bodywork would allow. But it's still, you know, still hidden quite nicely under the, under the dimensions of the car. Um, and initial testing went as well as any initial testing always does, which is quite rough. It has a, a tendency to roll the slot which means a high center of gravity and too narrow track at the rear, but I don't want to put wheel arches on it. So I'm going to have to work with that. And I'll probably put some suspension in there and various other things to mitigate that. It's got a lightweight interior and the, um, the helmets are helmets out of a, um, a spirit model out of a spirit Peugeot because I never used the lightweight interiors. Sorry, I never used the standard interiors for those cars, so I just stole the helmets out of the, 
out of my pit, out of my box of bits, and just two nice matching helmets there. I haven't really done a lot of work on the interior, but it's sort of there, and um, I'm hoping that others will catch the book for refurbishing TR7s like this, uh, creating refurbishing scaly TR7s, and then maybe we can do a proxy or something. So, is there, Helen, is there something that's stopping you dropping the rear of that car down another millimeter or so? Well, yeah, it's it's the bodywork. If I just pull it up like this, you really, you can just about see it. I'm right on the edge there. I, I wanted the wheels out at 58 mil. You really uh -huh. can't see it, I'm afraid. I'd have to, to drop them down, to drop it down further. Yeah, it's catching on it's catching on the wheel arches like that. To drop it down further, I would have to pull the wheels in. And, and you'd have to limit the amount that it's that it, that the body's rocking, right? Right. That's right. So limiting the the body rock would mean it would be more likely to roll. Allowing the body to rock means it can roll and, and hit on the rubber. Lifting the body to stop it doing that means it's more likely to roll. So it's a combination of all these difficult um difficult factors to try and get it to work I mean, it worked okay as a first trial run and i'm sure when i get it all running properly it will work just fine it still runs it still runs better than a real tr7 uh i'd say about about the same actually <laughs> what I would remind say is, me alan remind me to take some photographs of the one that's around the corner from me it's, okay. it's a replica it's the red red one with the white and blue stripes okay I'll get. I'll ask him because he's got it covered up at the moment. So I'll, I'll ask him, and uh, if I get some photos, I'll put them up on here next week. Do, do it soon before it becomes part of the earth. Yeah, I'm very. Uh, I'm very tempted to say to Alan, a big piece of lead under the back of that car would would sort him out. But I know what Alan's like with lead. The very, very last thing I will do is put <laughs> but I will. But it Alan, actually, John, it doesn't handle like a real TR7. It's more like a TR V8 because it really does go like stink in a straight line. And that's down to the, um, that's the Scale Auto SC30 motor. So the so-called outlaw motor, which is 400 gram GCM and 35 K RPM. So it, it goes, it really goes. And you know, that's the way I do it. I overpower them and then I work them hard to try and get that power under control. This would be completely unsuitable for a proxy the way I've built it. But for London Skeletra, it, it's, you know, it will get there, it'll be fine. So you, you built a four wheeled Marshall Ant? Yeah, something like that. Everything louder than everything else. That's how I like to build them. <laughs> as long as it goes to a- Less is not more. Less is not more, more is more. Less is just less. So does it stop <laughs> as good as it goes? Actually, it does, but because it goes so quick down the straight, it had, it did have one straight line. Oh, look, I recognize that girl. What's that, Leo? Hi, Greenie. We, 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 spoke, <laughs> about this, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. With has the he driver. still got a cigarette? Yeah, he's still got a cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> So it's with, it's with me just now. So I thought I'd show it for on behalf of Alan. Sorry, I can't hold it very steady, but um, you can you can see the cigarette quite clearly. It's very well done. Yeah. I tried to take photographs of it to show tonight, but I'm afraid I can't do it any justice. So I've abandoned the photographs. <laughs> well, but it's a hanging uh, dice still hanging over the the uh, rear view mirror. I tried to make some dice. I, <laughs> oh, so yes, yes, yes. Can you see the rear view mirror? <laughs> yeah, nice. that, that that is awesome. That Every is awesome. Capri that's, what 19, <laughs> that's what a nineteen seventies rally car should look like. Yeah. <laughs> if it was in South Africa, it would have a, a little plastic orange on the aerial. Because the SRC okay. does not have an, an aerial. So I put one on it from my spares box. I just wanted a little bit more. You know, a little bit more there than SRC give. And, you know, although I'm not winning this proxy, I'm losing in style. <laughs> <laughs> you should have put the old Brenda and, Sh and Sean on the on the old uh, wind sun visor. Like his and hers or yeah. Wayne yeah. and Sharon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Starter strap. <laughs> Welcome, Wayne. <laughs>
I noticed you, you've got two helmets in your circuit racing TR7. I just wondered whether it'd be beneficial to remove the co-driver somehow. It's a rally. Well, I, it's a lightweight interior. So, you know, a lot of the interior weight's gone. And it does, uh, it's does look like the, does look like the, the driver's looking across at the net. To represent a rally, it's a rally livery. Yeah, uh, It's got the rally front bumper with the lights on. So although it's probably never going to be good on an off-road track like an Inca ice track, uh, you know, it, it'll look the part to be a rally car, and that would be what that would be the class I would enter it in. If any club out there runs 1970s classic rally cars, but let's face it, I don't think there are many 132 classic 70s rally car. I mean, I think the SRC Capri is the only one I can think of straight off, off the back of my, my head. All, 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 all the, the scale S electrics and the, the uh, escorts in it. You got the escorts. You got yeah, the Porsche uh, 911s, the BMW 3 liter CSL, all from still like in the 1980s. The, 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 the only the SCX one put a 3D chassis under it, uh, a thunder slot motor in it. Tried it rocking them on um, oh. Friday, and it absolutely flew. So I built a few others, but which weren't as good. But um, yeah, you know, I didn't put a 35k in it though, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the, Brit the British Leyland Minis from the 70s and 80s. Alan, at least I there's don't... one good thing. When that stops, the marshal will be the person that stops it. Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm not standing down the end of that straight. <laughs> hey, it's not going to be the quickest thing down at Woodgreen by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, there are some down there that are pushing 12 metres per second now on that main straight so you know it really is it's uh yeah we have one guy who volunteers to be down there and we like to volunteer him to be down there so that's good <laughs> so all padded up i was gonna say he, he, must, he, must, he, must, he, must, he must be used to playing cricket then right is that what it is or he's no, a hockey or he's a hockey goalkeeper <laughs> it just you know it's either way it's, he's wearing some protection i'm sure <laughs> no, he's just really quick to get out of the way. So, um, <laughs> and, and, but not many people crash on that main straight because dear old Pete is not known as the fastest of marshals. So if you throw your car off there, you're not winning any races. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, I got something for you guys too this week. Go ahead, Dennis. Something a little, a little different. This is something that I did yesterday. Let's see if I can get it into the. Uh, no. Let's try that. How's Ooh, that? Oh, uh, I have a customer who said to me, you know, have you ever built any HO scale cars? And I said, no. He said, well, do you want to try? And I said, yes. <laughs> so he sent, he sent me a whole bunch of um, bits and pieces. And in amongst all the bits and pieces was this, which is a, which was a kit, right? And it's a, it's a kit made by a guy in Arizona uh, under the name of Landshark, a fellow by the name of Al Thurman. I've met him, a really nice guy, and big into HO scale stuff. And they run a lot of these um, gravity cars or brass cars. And so uh, I assembled this kit with a couple of my own little ideas in it. And uh, so that's what I've just done. Um, what, what size of motor is that? It's uh... unbelievably tiny motor, right? Uh, I think they're, they're kind of like the motors that come out of the tail rotor drives of the of radio control, the small radio control helicopters. Wow. It's, it's, it's tiny, but it revs like hell. I have actually, you can see there's a resistor in the line. Yeah. A it's a 10 ohm resistor to try and, to try and cut down the, the performance. Apparently. I mean, I know nothing about them. I've just built this one. And um, so, yeah, it was, that was a lesson in frustration, I'll tell you. Well, how, about I, send you a, so how about I send you one of those little motorcycles and you can motorize it for us? <laughs> or one of those go-karts of Steve's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, even better, yeah. Well, you know what, that motor might be perfect for it. That would be perfect for it. Yeah. What, size is, that? what size is the motor? Um, let me grab a, let me grab a, uh, uh, grab a um, ruler sure. and I'll tell you. Hold on. But, but while Dennis is going away, the other den's here. 
Um, there are small motors like that. I think they're called Solobotics or something like that. Uh, the, yeah, the I don't know, Dan. Yeah. I don't know where they come from. Yeah. So the yeah, whole the motor is the motor is fifteen millimeters long on, along the can, right? Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's, uh, that length, uh, total length there is fifteen millimeters. Okay. Uh, diameter wise, across there it looks like about nine. Okay. Yeah, about nine millimeters, and high is probably only about seven by the looks of it. But it is it is tiny. Those what does it weigh, Dennis? Yeah. What is the whole car weigh? I don't mm. know yet. I haven't actually weighed it. Let me grab a scale. Twenty grams. That, that motor is considerably smaller than the Solar Botics, Dan. Boy, I that's... Think, I, I'm not sure. I think the class. I think it's an HT50 or an HT30. Geez, that's little. All right, there's my scale in grams. That whole car weighs <clears throat> 17 grams, one seven. Yeah. yeah it would handle a bigger motor, wouldn't it? There's room in there. Oh, I tell you something though. That when I when I put this motor onto um, onto a power supply at four volts, the thing revs like hell. What what size is the um, the, the pinion? Like what what gears go on there? The the shaft of the motor is one millimeter diameter, so they have um, special pinions for it. The axles front and rear are um, are one point uh, or one sixteenth piano wire. Um, the gears and the and the rear wheels just press on. Uh, the rear wheels are uh, some kind of foam that's been covered with clear silicone, and then they the, they they just press onto the axle. There's no uh, there's no uh, nothing. It's just a an interference fit, and then at the front, um, I had to insulate the, all the brass. So there's a piece of clear tape underneath everything. And then on top of that, I, I used uh, two little bits and pieces of brake clips from a 24 scale car that I glued on there. And then the, the uh, phosphor bronze um, pickup leaves actually slide through that and fold underneath. And then underneath that whole section is also insulated. What, and what are, what are the axles? Are they 332nd or? No, they're 1 16th. Whoa. And they're they're sixteenth of an inch uh, piano wire, uh, which I cut. Um, I actually had to drill out the bushings in the rear uh, to to sixteenth because the bushings that I was supplied were one point five millimeter, but uh, he didn't supply me enough axles, so uh, I had to use that. Yeah, fun times. That's awesome. Can you, I mean my head spinning because you know those little Arai kits, you know of those micro yeah. Japanese yeah. cars. You'd have a ball with that motor and yeah. oh, oh yeah. So that's that that whole thing. It's uh, the wheelbase is an inch and a half. Hold on a moment. I've got to go. Excuse me, guys. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Sure. Looks like uh, Big Dan is ready to show something off. Yeah. I'm Dennis. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm busy. If you if you look the um, uh, standard S can in the Penelope pit lane chassis there, there's the little what we call down here, Solobotics motors. You can see it's quite a bit smaller. Yeah, that's still yeah. much bigger than what uh, Dennis said. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. I was going to show you these that I've got a while back. That's an S-can. Yeah. And that's a, that's a micro, really much mm -hmm. smaller, out of China. Yeah, yeah well, now the O3O motors are even smaller than that, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. They tried running the solar botics in some of the um, Tasman Cup proxy races down here a couple of years ago, and someone described them as being full of smoke, and it used to used to come out during the race. <laughs> but, uh, if you, yeah. well, that's how they work. They work on smoke. So, so Steve, we're 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 determined to get those go karts literally going for you with a driver and a motor yeah I'll let, i need to know from dennis if the shaft and that motor comes out of both ends if there's oh, a I shaft on if there's a shaft on both ends you could mount it in this little go-kart it does not those motors uh, are single it's only can end on the on that motor yeah 
Sorry, guys, about that. Um, my son just bought a house and he's in South Carolina, but the house is here in Orange County. And uh, so the realtor was just delivering the key. Oh, so congrats, Dennis, congratulations. Dennis, does the shaft come out of both ends of that motor or just no, one? No, just one end. All right. Okay. Have to come up with a spur gear. <laughs> just we'll one make, end. We'll make okay. it work. We'll make it work. Make it, yeah. <laughs> And like a one minute, everyone's going to be pulling their helicopters yeah. apart now and looking for the motors. <laughs> yeah, that, mo <clears throat> that motor is tiny, even by HO scale standards. Wayne will tell you that the, you know, they used to be quite a bit bigger than that. Um, you go to go to any toy store and, and look at hex bugs. They're basically, you know, counter counterweighted motors, right? So that they, yeah. they vibrate because they're spinning a little weight. And eccentric mm -hmm. yeah and so the the motors making them are tiny tiny teeny weeny little things yeah. you can buy most of those you can buy those motors from most of the better ho um suppliers yeah, or srt has them and wizard has them and a few other guys have uh the little things buy, buy a bag of 100 off of ebay on china and, and you get one or two good motors out of it well <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I've seen motors you know, that size in AliExpress, places like that. I think you were right with the HT30 designation, Chris. Yeah, I. Yeah, it's been a while since I've played a lot in HO. I, I think it's a, I think it's an HT30, although that might be the uh, little uh, uh, Tyco strap can thing. Yeah, and only one of the HO cars I ever played with had a, had a motor in a can. In most cases, the chassis is the can. They don't have a can. They're just a pair of motor, a pair of magnets, and an armature flying there. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Chris, have you ever made a one thirty second scale tiny car out of one of those motors just uh, to see if it would work? Um, not those. Um, as Dennis said, I mean, you, you've you've got it's a gravity car which has no magnetic downforce, obviously, and the weight of that car is such that. They, with that little motor in a gravity HO car, they just scream. You, they would embarrass a lot of 30 second scale cars. Um, having said that, when you build a lightweight um, 30 second scale car for the Formula One proxies, they're like 65 grams and they're just too heavy for that little bugger. Yeah, it wouldn't so make, enough, that, wouldn't yeah. make enough talk, would it? Just Sorry? It wouldn't make enough torque to get the thing going. It's it no. rev, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to achieve a small enough gear ratio to make it uh, pull right. that amount of weight yeah. around. Right. Yeah, I, I think that was what they found in the proxy down here that you know getting the gearing right was the way to stop them you know catching fire or smoking. Yeah. Um, j just looking at this chassis, this is a this is a standard Penelope pit lane chassis called a concourse, and. It will only fit that motor. It won't fit anything else. So there must be a few of them around for, for Penelope Pit Lane to make a chassis specific for that for that motor. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't a lot fit, of the guys in the Tasman series use that, then. Yeah. All right. What's the, what's the Tasman series? Uh, Tasman series was uh, uh, an F1 uh, series for cars in the sort of 60, mid 60s, Formula One cars. One and a half liter. That's right. right. Yeah, it, it, it was the off season Formula One series that happened in New Zealand and Australia. Australia. But it was with smaller engines. They used what? Two One and a half liter. And half. One and a half. I think that and was up to, Yeah, you're right. Up to about 2.3 or 2.4. Yeah. They were slightly off the Formula Ones when they changed to the three liter. For, for, for the drivers, it was an opportunity for them to, to basically have a paid vacation. <clears throat> it was easy. It was, it was also the first time outside of South Africa that a car ever ran with uh, cigarette sponsorship. That, that's right. Yeah, that was the Lotus. Because yeah. 1968, uh, I think it was, at the Grand Prix in South Africa on January 1st, was the first time that any that any Formula One car ever ran with cigarette sponsorship, and that was Gunston from uh, from what was then Rhodesia that sponsored uh, John Love's um, 
think he was running at Brabham and uh, Sam Tingle, both Brabham's actually, as I recall. And then uh, in the Tasman series, then Lotus started using the Gold Leaf Team Lotus right. colors. And then when they got to Europe, then the, the Spanish Grand Prix was the first one in Europe that had the, the, the tobacco sponsorship. Yeah, that's right, because Clark never drove a, a, a sponsored car in Formula One. That's right. No, but he did in the Tasman series. He did yeah. in the Tasman series. That's right. Yeah. In fact, he was responsible for that that livery for making sure it happened. I so. think he I think he died in a in a cigarette sponsored Formula Two. That's, that's correct. correct. Yeah, Hockenheim. Yeah, that's yep. right. But he never he never got the Formula One. Yeah. No. That was that's another one of those things like the day that Kennedy was was shot or the day or 9-11. Everybody remembers the day that we heard that Jim Clark had died in a Formula Two car. It was just so manifestly unfair. And oh, so, it, was, it, was, it was an impossibility. I mean, that's what yeah. everyone thought, yeah. Like Senna and Villeneuve as well. Yeah. yeah. My, my grandma died the same day as Jim Clark. I think that Jim Clark upset me a whole lot more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't really admit that, but... Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she's not around. You're right, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean people. How, how, how far? <laughs> how, come on. I mean, how far in racing did she get? <laughs> yeah, that's the point. Yeah, she could have a wheelchair yeah. up on, to, on one wheel going around the corner. Yeah, well, I mean, she was 78 years old, so I suppose it wasn't that unexpected at that point. Anyway, just want to show you a car that uh, uh, last time I was on, I showed you the Brabham this car made. And I've got the BRM P160 from him. And it's, I think it's, it's a, the, the classic fiberglass body. And anybody uh -huh. who's worked with these knows how difficult and horrible they are. Yeah. That's a, well, yeah, that's a worked, fiberglass body? Yeah, yeah Peter, better in classics, yeah. That's this beautiful. guy has worked absolute wonders. Who's the guy? This it's a guy the... called, I can't think of his surname, it's Radomir. He lives in Czech Republic. Oh. Um, but this is, it's just mind boggling. I just have to, I've, I've been speaking to him and he showed me his collection of cars. He hasn't got a big collection, but he's got six or seven of them and the, his cars are just wonderful. Wonderful. And they were, they sold for, for nothing, I hate to say. Yeah. For him. Yeah. So. How long does he that. take to build them? No idea. He showed me pictures of the ones that he's building. And I can tell you that it's probably weeks. Mm to be honest. And then one other thing to show you, because it's the first time I've ever seen this. Can you see it? Oh, good. It's, it's the Elf guy who I've got it from, sadly, you can see how bad the windows are and how much work I'm gonna to have to do on them. But it's a plastic um, oh, so that, competition. It's not oh, so the that's monogram. Not, that's, not the, that's not the monogram? No, it's plastic. Wow. So it's a, uh, for, unfortunately, the pictures that he put up were a lot better than what's arrived. But uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the other showing tiles. Well, that, that's okay. I, I look much better in pictures than in real life. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not what your wife says. <laughs> that's a good reason not to go to Canada, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture on, him on the board. If you know this man, you're not in coming into Canada. <laughs> oh, I got something. Isn't that Cobra the uh, the revised design that Pete Brock did afterwards? Yeah. The second and design. It's got this this forward sloping rear end. Yeah, correct. So I don't know if you can, if you if I put it sideways yeah. like this, you can yeah, see the, it. The, the car. They, they car called it. Yeah. They called it the super competition. Right. Um, it didn't get yeah, the out of the design engine, stage, and I think it's, it ran around a couple of private roads for a while, um, but it never it never got off the ground in racing. Yeah, it, never ra it was never raced, no. 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 Probably it is, it like is viable ocean. now, I believe. Oh, well, as a, a historic racer, you mean? Yeah, I think there's, if I read something recently about it. Um, that it was redone um, and finished. Um, the reason it wasn't redone or it wasn't finished originally was because uh, Ford put the kibosh on it uh, in favor of the Ford GT instead of, uh, it was sort of a contingency for Pete Brock to make for if 
Ford uh, didn't give him the, the contract for the Ford GTs. Well, yeah, and then it was abandoned as a result of him getting that contract. Right. That would make sense because the, the Cobra uh, Daytona project kind of went away once the uh, once Ford said, please fix the GT for us. Yeah, and that was a changing of an era because, you know, you know that those uh, Shelby Cobras and a lot of the cars that were designed that way, as soon as those mid-engine cars came in, that was the end of an era. Done. So, you know. That, that was just how it was going to be from that point forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for everyone, to your point, Al, I mean, even Ferrari went from the 250 GTO to the, you know, the 250 LM with the mid-engine. I've really got to get a 250 GTO 132. It's not, not easy to find them. I believe Fly made one. Uh, and I really would like to get one of those and then put, a, you know, something like an HRS2 or a, uh, 3D chassis underneath it. Do, do, do you like the oh, yeah. I'm just about I think to the... release them, Alan. Well, that they are releasing them again. They're on pre order. Well, they're that doing two deliveries. Handles, here I come. You can also get the TA71, have brought out a 330 and a 250. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I've got the 250. What, what about, uh, does any, like, am I the only one who really likes the old Revell 250? I, I think that's a well, one as well. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say that's the, that's a really nice one. That's my favorite. I think they've really captured the, uh, the essence mm -hmm. of the car. It's so swoopy. And it's closer to scale than the fly stuff too. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Actually not, not to plug my channel, but if you go on my channel, I actually put a brass chassis under one. Mm, lovely. Was it that horrible red kit? <laughs> I started to think the plastic was a horrible color, wasn't it? Oh yeah, but you know what? The great thing is it really loves paint. Like a little bit of a little bit of a scuff, and oh my goodness, you it, it the paint really oh, sticks to it. I'm just gonna shut the curtain. I've been blinded by sunshine. It's unusual here in the UK. Shouldn't it be <laughs> raining there? I thought it had to rain there. Isn't that a law? No, no today, that, to, this is sunshine. Today is today is the day for summer in the UK. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. Father, no, you're talking no, about the river. Yes, the river. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that looks good. So I had to find it. I couldn't find it in, 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 in my room here, of course. I still have to put exhausts on it. Uh, but I decided I wanted to do other than red Ferrari. So that's a 124th. And that's the, the Oh, Revo. nice. Both from Ravel. Yeah. Um, no, this is a Hasagawa. Oh, oh okay. is it really? Yeah. Wow. Well, I have a I have a show and tell, so I'll go ahead and show and tell. Good. Yeah. I recently got the Batmobile. <laughs> oh. I, just, ah. I decided to have a parade of all my iconic show and movie cars. So of course we have the original Batmobile, Back to the Future, DeLorean, Dukes of Hazard, both of the Max no, uh, cars. Both of the Bumblebee style cars, uh, the Camaro and the Bug, and then of course Cars, Cars. <laughs> couldn't resist. I'm, I, I, I have the kit, K I T T, on on pre order as well, so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, probably something else that I'm dying for. But once I Sky get Electric's, it, Sky Electric's produced the kit a while, uh, 20, 30 uh, years ago. Yeah, I don't want that crappy one. I want the nice looking one that they're making this year. <laughs> That's I'm a real Batmobile. Del Boy three wheeler. Yeah, that's yes. But yeah. he, no. but Greg probably doesn't know who Del Boy is. Probably not. Only fools and horses. <laughs> no. Little reliant Robin. I, I, I'm a. It's electrical. Oh I'm a, yeah, what, Mr. That's the car. That was the car Mr. Bean always used to tip over. No, no, no. it was a mini. That's a no, no, no. He, he, there was a Reliant Robin that he used to drive by and used to tip over. It was like the nemesis of his Mini. Don't remember well, that. The only Mr. Bean fan. Yeah. Okay, I'll just be quiet. <laughs> I think that you've been watching too much Top Gear. That's what they... Jeremy Clarkson done that, didn't he? Kept yeah. tipping it on its side. Yeah. My, my favorite was when he drove the Cyclops into the BBC offices. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> It looks like Del Brian Boy's is Reliant is actually a Reliant Regal, not a Reliant Robin. Oh, Robin yeah. is more Reliant. Oh, of course. Brian, are you ready to do your show and tell? Yeah, I got time now. I'm okay. my 
Go Zoom meeting's it. over. Um, interestingly enough, I attended a slot car show this weekend here in the St. Louis area and picked up a few cars. Nothing exciting for as far as you guys are concerned, probably, but all brand new cars to me. And one was this uh, Fly Celine. Very nice car, runs very well. The amount of detail on the back of this thing, though, is insane, though. I took the body off to do, you know, your basic lubrication. There are eight different pieces under there that make up the engine detail on this. Um, so when I lifted the body off and it all fell off, it was kind of like, oh, crap. <laughs> but uh, I did manage to get it back together. Car runs quite well. Very pleased. And I was able to get it back together because picked up two of them so i had another one to kind of go by <laughs> so That's a couple the of the corvette, isn't it? the corvette's got so much engine detail in the back of it you take the body yeah. off and it's the same thing it falls apart those things are scary i broke the back cracked the back window on one i had because trying to get it back together after i had taken it apart this is the part i really don't like the uh it has not come off while i'm running it yet but it just uses two tiny little pins to hold it in place on there. So I knock it off when I pick the car up. Haven't knocked it off running it yet, but <laughs> picking up the car, oops, it uh, it seems to like to fall off. So I got those two. The next two are a couple fly. There we go. Daytona prototypes. All right, colors. Yeah. <laughs> Both again. What was it? I, I, I didn't hear what it was. Daytona prototypes. Daytona prototypes, they're flies. Um, I could have bought, and I probably should have, they had some racer sideways at these as well. Um, but I ended up going with the flies from one of the local club guys. The racer sideways ones are really good cars. Yeah, and I could have got them for $35 a piece brand new. Yeah, that's not bad. They were without a box. They were display pieces, but they were brand new. Next one, slot it, Audi. Brand new. Nice. All right. Very nice. This Does one was your wife kind of know you bought all these? Say what now? Does your wife know you bought all these or did you oh, smuggle yeah. them in? I actually spent less money than I took. <laughs> <laughs> um, third one? Uh, if she's like my wife, she knows now. <laughs> oh, yeah, she knows. Fly 908. Missing the wing? Or did that not have a full wing? No, the 908 have Flunder. No, it doesn't Flunder. have a wing. It's just those two little yep, spins at the rear. Right. There's is a nice car, wing? actually. They, they run pretty well. Yeah, it's the slowest of the bunch, but it is very smooth, and it does run well. And and I love the body style. There's three more of these out there available that I'd like to get my hands on. I, I that, think they're gorgeous. That, that, that didn't race in real life, did it? That color. Because that's a mock-up of a, of a Can-Am car. No. No, no, no. I mean, Tony no, Dean no. ran the uh, 908s in Canada. I don't think the Flunder ever raced in the Canada. Yeah. Flunder Not didn't. In those colors. I was going to say, it did race at Le Mans. That one would have they... raced at Le Mans. And I don't remember whether it raced in those colors. I think maybe it was one of Fly's, um, you know, taking there's, there's chances. One in, but... There's one By in the green way, and white. One of them raced at, at Kailami. Yeah, there's one in green and white. Hours. I think it has Joseph. Yeah, but I don't know that they raced um, with the long tail at Kyle Long. No, they? they did. I saw it the other day. Um, if you go and look at racingsportscars.com. Uh-huh. I saw it. I didn't know either, but it, it raced, I think, in 71 or 72. I mean, and last but not least. Oh, nice. This is a slot, uh, slot it. This was their limited edition. Of course, 7,000 of them is hardly limited edition. But again, brand new. Uh-huh. The, yeah, the, the two slotted did include the boxes as well as the uh, the only one that didn't come in the box was the Flunder. Um, it was a it was a display car, brand new, never run, but had no box. Now here's the news: those seven cars I just showed you, total dollars spent two hundred. Wow. Ooh, wow. 30 bucks a piece. Less than 30 bucks a piece. All brand new. That's nice. That's awesome. Now, the uh, the only other one that was purchased, my son picked up. Okay. I haven't taken this one out of the box yet. 
that's probably a good thing. Yeah, leave that yeah. leave that in the box. Leave that, in, that, leave that no, one no, in the no. box. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> See, it was bought to be a mate for one of our favorites, Creepy Crawly. Oh, okay. Well, now, just get a, box, get a box for the Creepy Crawly and you'll be all set. <laughs> I still have it. That car is a decade <laughs> old. I've never broken a piece off it. It runs like a rape ape. It doesn't stop, but it runs like a rape ape. Yeah. Um, and actually, with Magnet on our track, once you get oh, with the Magnet, it, yeah. it's one of my yeah, fastest no, that's, cars. That's true. Yeah. It's 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 different to drive than anything else yeah. I have, but uh, <laughs> it is a blast to drive. So I would have loved to got the Red Lobster one as well, but not there. Yeah. So now the, the next question is, and Bartlett, you cannot answer this. Does anybody know what that creepy crawly is? The sponsor. Pool cleaner. Yeah. Oh, who was that? Mark. Chris. <laughs> oh, Mark. Okay. Yeah. I, it was have, a, I have one in the backyard. Creepy crawly was a South African uh, invention of the automatic swimming pool cleaner, yeah. home pool cleaner. Worked really well. Do they still make them, Dennis? Do they? I don't know. I don't know either. You don't have pools in Europe. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a pool either. Not here. I was just, uh, I turned mine off about 20 minutes before uh, I came on the chat here. Oh, okay. You have a pool in Canada? <coughs> yeah, well, yeah. where else are you going to yeah, practice? It's an, ice, it's an ice rink in the winter. Yeah, I was, was going to say, where else would you practice? For the rest practice? of the year, we put the boards up and pull yeah. the puck out, and yeah. away we go. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday, it was 31 degrees. Yeah, it was, it's, it's warm here now. Yeah, but 31 Fahrenheit, it's not that hot. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's still not above freezing, yeah. So I yeah. guess all in all, the fact that I got to go to a slot car show this weekend was terrific. Yeah. And the fact that I came home with seven pretty nice cars <laughs> for 200 bucks was just icing on the cake. Yeah, I'm very nice. jealous, I got to tell you. Good yep. job. Well, Brian, yeah, well Brian it's, it, listen, th thank you for giving us all hope that we're all going to get back to some uh, some semblance of seeing each other in person. Yeah. I got, well, I got news this you, week I'm at the Bordeaux race. race. Some of you... It doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> sorry, say again. We missed that. I'm sorry. So that applies to some of you and to some of you, it doesn't. <laughs> Everyone brings joy to this meeting. Some on the way in, some on the way out. Yeah. Well, I, have to tell you, I have to tell you that the, 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 nice, the, the best T-shirt I saw shopping a little while ago was someone wearing straight out of quarantine. Instead of straight out of Compton, straight out of the corner. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. Sadly enough, I hate to say it, but I actually missed you guys. But we put my wife into hospice care about a month ago. Oh, dear. Oh, sorry and to hear that. Man. My time's been kind of eating up a little bit. Um, just keeping busy, and I can't seem to get on uh, to pick on Greg as much as I'd like to. So I think this is the first time in about five or six weeks that I've actually been on and had an opportunity to talk to anybody. So well, listen, I'm nice sure I'm, you all again. Well, listen, our thoughts are with you, man. Yeah. Um, take, take care, let, Brian. Let me quantify that a little bit. It's it's kind of a unique situation. My wife became disabled about two years ago when she had a minor stroke, um, and she's very prone to pneumonia. She has brain tumor left over from about 25, 35 years ago. Um, so basically she couldn't work anymore. What we had is nurses coming to the house. Whenever she needed to go to the doctor, we would have a nurse come to the house and her regular nurse was on maternity leave. So a substitute came and when she came to see her, she said, let me throw this at you. Have you ever considered hospice care? And like you guys, I've always thought of that, you know, typically that's when you have a diagnosis of death within the next six months. It's not the case anymore, at least not here in Illinois. The fact that we're not actively seeking restorative treatment for her brain tumor, which is inoperable, and anything else, basically what it comes down to is since she's on Medicare, I have a nurse come to the house twice a week. They pay for all of her equipment. They pay for all of her prescriptions, and nothing's changed. There has been no diagnosis of death. It's just been a busy time getting everything together. So okay. um, I appreciate the thoughts, and but I just want to let you know there has not been a diagnosis of pending death. 
the fact yeah, but that it's, it, fact it's still to, tough. Yeah, yes. it's still tough. It's tough. It's tough. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to work from home all this time. So, but she's doing okay. Um, it makes life a little easier on her actually, because somebody's here twice a week to check on her, as opposed to us having to wait till she's not feeling well, calling somebody and then somebody shows up and actually financially it, it helped. They now pay for all her food. She feeds through a tube. She has been for the last year and a half or so. I was paying all that out of pocket. Now they pay for all of it. So in a lot of ways, it was a good thing. So again, I appreciate the thoughts, um, but it's not as bleak as it sounds, or it could be. Well, that, that, that's you know how powerful those thoughts were? Just yeah, instantaneously that. better. <laughs> yeah, see, look at that. Got it. Love good vibes. Yeah. I'm not a prayer guy, but I'm a vibes guy. So. No, they work. I, I can attest to it. They do. Well, from bad news to good news. So that's always nice. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about or share and show or tell about? Or hey, Greg, just you mentioned the Batmobile. You showed us a Batmobile earlier. And uh, <clears throat> one of the notable things about the Batmobile is it comes with a Batman figurine, not with a Robin figurine. I expect that Skelectric will make another one with an updated paint job for <laughs> season that comes with it. Could be. Could be, but Gary Cannell of MRE was lobbying Skelectric or was trying to find a different manufacturer to make that Robin figurine so he could sell them. But in, in the interim, he sold MRE to Pendles. <laughs> so I don't know whether that, I don't know whether that, uh, that plan's still going ahead. But I, uh, I saw one put up on the forum this week, Alan, with, with a Robin figure in it. So somebody's made one somewhere. Oh, yeah, I, I, just, I just thought it was because Burt Ward gained too much weight. He couldn't fit in the car anymore. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they're using um, a Kogi Robin. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, didn't take notes to say, sorry. But That's I just saw the picture. The, the Kogi. Okay. I've got something to show, Greg. Go ahead. All right. Oops. I can't share my screen. Yes, you it's can. You're just not doing it right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm clicking on it, and it tells me host disabled participant screen sharing. I didn't, but let me double check. I'm not sure why. Oh, now I've got it. We're good. Um. I've been looking through, we're good now. Uh, I've been through my, uh, looking through my cabinet of curiosities. Can you guys see that? Not yet. No. You, might, you might have no. to start over. All right, let me try again. There we go. All right. Look, cause it, I had some scenery items and you ever wonder what to do with those extra clear cases <laughs> so i figured every every track needs a beer uh stand so i had put this one together um I'm trying to figure out i don't know if i can use it on my next track or not but i've had this one before but you know basically just build a structure around it and uh in the back i uh eh, let's see now where did my other screen go with me here a minute that looks really cool it worked out pretty well. And then, um, hmm. can't get the original, my, your screen back now, so I can. If, if, you, if, you, if you need the mark, I've cast little clear bottles for stuff around my. Yeah, that's, uh, that would be, well, I didn't have a lot of detail to this one. Um, God, I can't get back to the uh, Zoom meeting. You might have to stop sharing. Yeah, let me try that. Be a red I, I can't even I can't bring oh there we go you get it um the inside I just printed out the back there's just a simple counter but you know I got some beer taps back there and stuff I mean but you could do a lot more detail wise in these um if you are uh, and then the other thing I know John would appreciate this one on the uh you can see them in place 
there's some seating on the top, but this other one, I don't know if he probably recognizes the Ferrara Rocher candy. Yeah. Oh my God. I was just going to say those were the older ones with the, uh, with the, yeah, the, the nice big ones. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I look at stuff like this and say, yeah, you know, what can I do with that? Cause a lot of the buildings now, you know, are more like traditional, like sixties and fifties style buildings. So if you want anything contemporary, you got to kind of build it yourself. So I don't know if I'll have, um, this was on my first track too, so this is pretty old picture. But I don't know if I'll have, I probably won't have a place to put these on the uh, new one that I'm planning now. But uh, yeah, it's just fun. But again, it's just fun to find stuff and figure out, uh, you know, what you can do with it. Now, is the structure all foam core, Mark? The foam, the foam core, yeah. And the bottom of that is just foam core, just printed out, and then just you know with self adhesive paper. This is a piece of foam core here, and all this above here is just foam core, and it just fits in there's a section in the bottom i never lit it i was going to now i mean the leds and everything are so easy to set up when i originally did this i was actually going to light it from below because it's right. clear in the bottom the light was going to come up but you know i never never got around to doing that but uh but yeah i don't know i'll figure out some use for these at some point I'll, i definitely will still use the uh beer house because obviously got to have that on a track Oh yeah, it would be really cool in front of the beer houses. You know, the monogram laying down uh, mechanic sort of alter him as to somebody who's imbibed a wee bit too much. Yeah, and they won't run out of beer either. You can see the keg, so I still got. Oh that. yeah, good. <laughs> oh right, yeah, that's awesome. All right, that's it. <laughs> I've just seen what I, I, I thought. I've seen that before somewhere. It's on Boone's page, isn't it? <laughs> you put it. it yeah, it's... yeah, yeah. I, I dropped that in there just a couple of days ago. I, Doug these out. <laughs> That's good. I like. I, I like that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else got anything they want to share? So, like, so I did have a topic idea. <clears throat> there was a discussion on uh, Slot Car Illustrated about, you know, magnets. Of course, you know, magnets versus no magnets, and you know, one of the more prolific stirrers of turds <laughs> likes likes to get on there and basically you know be the the opposition to pretty much anything that he <clears throat> to i'm sure most of you know exactly who i'm talking about it's been kicked off of most forums anyways this particular forum has not yet kicked him off and he kept making this point that uh you know magnets are are great you know not the super strong neodymium magnets but just you know, regular old, you know, not so strong magnets, you know, make a, make a car run nice. It's, you know, blah, blah, blah. He kept saying that we're all hating on strong magnets. He's saying that weak magnets are, are a good thing. And I pointedly said, <laughs> I made my point many times saying, it's not about the strength of the magnets. It's about when you have a competition, you have to set a limit and therefore there is, everyone attempts to reach but not exceed that limit. You have to have a, a way to measure so that people aren't exceeding the limit because otherwise it's just a crap shoot. You got, to, everybody is just doing everything they can to, to, to get the strongest magnets or reach the limit. And one of the, one of the many things that I personally don't like about magnet cars in general is that it's a pain in the ass to tune the magnets to, to, to get close to that limit without exceeding it. So rather than having an, an, and so I pointedly asked him specifically, I said, Mr. Since you're so gung ho, <coughs> tell us what you do because he specifically said magnets are an, a tuning device, just like, just like weight and tire <coughs> and all these other things that people use. I said, Mr. Tell me your process of tuning magnets. What do you do to reach the prescribed limit or get as close as possible without exceeding it in whatever car? I don't care what the limit is. I don't care what cars you're talking about. How do you go through that process? So rather than say <laughs> whether you like magnets or not, if you were to be in that position, what kinds of things do you do to achieve the most magnet that you can within the boundaries of whatever your whatever competition you're having. Dennis was holding up the, the something. Do you want to address that question, Dennis, or were you just wanting to show off that car some more? <laughs> you're muted, by the way. 
No, my apologies. I had to move to uh, to unplug a soldering iron that I'd forgotten to unplug. Yeah, don't leave those on unless you're. Uh, I I did already leave it on overnight, but fortunately, it's just a little forty watt jobby, so it hasn't uh, it hasn't burned my garage to the ground yet. Just wasted electricity. You're, yeah. you're burning the planet down, Dennis. It's yeah, yeah, I know. I'll try not to <laughs> that. I'm sorry. Does, I will. Does, I will do. That... I will do my my extra hail Gregs and uh, rosaries tonight. <laughs> well, maybe I'll force you to address the topic. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'm interested to hear what this guy had to say about how he tunes for magnets. Yeah. Well, surprisingly, he has not responded to that. <laughs> He's posted elsewhere on the forum in, in response to <coughs> things that he wanted to stir turds on. But this particular one, he did not respond to my request. Which forum is this? It was Slot Car Illustrated. Oh, jeez. Yeah. The, the gentleman has been banned from every other slot forum online. There's do they have, do they actually even still exist, Slot Car, for, slot car Illustrated? It does still exist. It, it's functioning better than Slot Forum at times. Is his first name begin with A? Uh, not, not. I don't believe so. No. Why, why are we giving this Billy no mates airtime? <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting topic because uh, I mean, since nobody else is diving in, unless unless I'm just yeah. interrupting, anybody else want to jump in on how to tune magnets? Interesting. Uh, interestingly, right. oh, interestingly, I don't think he even races thirty-second scale cars, but that's beside the point. I don't believe he does either. Which no, is he's basic, basically an HO guy. Um, but that's maybe we're talking about the same guy. Maybe we're not. Um, they are. <laughs> but uh, you know, Mister Mister Rosberg's quite a guy. Um, oh, that guy. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, that guy. <laughs> that's the, the, I mean, fundamentally, with with magnet cars, um, the actual magnet downforce is important, but the magnet downforce, as it relates to the total all-up car weight, is equally as important. So, if you can, if you have a, a hundred grams of downforce and a car that weighs fifty grams the car will really, you know, stick to the track like crazy. Um, if you've got 100 grams of downforce and you've got a 200 gram car, the, the magnets are working overtime to keep the, um, you know, keep the car on the track. So, I mean, perfect, perfect uh, illustration of that is, you know, take your magnet car and drive it around the track, then put it on the track without the body. It goes like twice as fast. Um, so tuning with magnets, we, we ran a magnet class at mini grid for a lot of the guys wanted to keep one magnet class. And it's a huge, as you said, it's a huge pain in the ass because the, the magnet marshal, I put my car, I, I put your car on once and tack it and it comes out at 105 grams. I take it off and put it right back on the magnet marshal and it comes in at 96 grams. Like it's, it's just, it's nuts. Um, <laughs> Chris, are they that inaccurate? Yes. Oh. Well, not, I don't think it's that quite. It's not that the tool is necessarily inaccurate. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a tolerance that that's yeah. not that big, but but more than you'd want it to be. But I think a, a speck of dust on the tire is yeah. going to raise the car up enough to to have a different reading. Or yeah. what we'll do is we'll put it on the magnet marshal and then we'll roll it a little bit because the rotation of the of the motor will have a different effect, and and the thickness of the tire at that point will have it will have an impact on the effect. So we usually take three or four readings to make sure that at no point is it greatly exceeding the the limit. And usually it's well under. Yeah, you, you do need to have a little bit of leeway on the whole thing, John. Like you can't you can't say a hundred grams and you know some guy puts it on it it's 101 grams you can't disqualify him because there's i mean that the, the error factor in there is is quite significant but you know where to place weight how or where to place magnets how much to place magnets um again depends on track depends on a whole bunch of factors but the the key and the key thing in making a magnet car go fast is get rid of all the weight you possibly can. So the magnets 
are as effective. You know, you, you have two car, you have a Carrera car uh, at a couple of hundred grams with 100 grams of downforce and a, a scaly at 80 grams with 100 grams of downforce, the scaly is just going to walk away. I don't, I don't want to get too much into the, the theory of magnet, does, you know, tuning. I'm, I'm, think, I'm talking more about the actual practical application of, I have a hundred, let's, let's ignore the grams, right? I have a car. Uh, okay, we'll have to have a, a gram. So we'll say a hundred grams magnetic downforce, car weight aside. I have a scaly, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get close to a hundred, but not get over a hundred. What do I do? I have things that I, that I know of, which Smaller is- Smaller rear tires. What was that, John? Smaller rear tires on the back. The well, as soon as you go smaller, as soon as you go smaller on the rear tires, then the downforce is going to go up. So if it's already at 100, uh, then with smaller rear tires, you're not going to be legal. I think that's a great example of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Let's, say, let's say my the limit is 100 grams, and I put my car on and it's 80 grams. I'm like, well, that's way too much lower. Yeah, then you can go to smaller tires. Then I put the smaller tires on, and then I reweigh it, and then now it's coming yeah. at 120 grams. So then you went too far on the tires. Yeah. So then you put your old tires back on and then what? Or you leave those tires on and you do other things like- Yeah, you, you move the magnet tape, back. You, you wow. move the magnet up. You put, you put a slip of tape under the magnet or in, in some cases you warm up the magnet and hope that it loses some of its pull after it cools down. <laughs> it's so-, <laughs> so Rick, in, this, in this world of like the modern 132 cars where we've got grub screws that elevate the body on four corners where well, we've got lots of different ways to get the, you know shims underneath the guides we can balance it we've got set plates so we can get the car flat it's really notable that all the cars that are produced with magnet apertures do not have any way to adjust the height and it's, it's an inverse square so yep. sh you know if, if it was a serious tuning now, I, I hate magnets because it overwhelms every other tuning method. Once you put magnets in a car, you can do anything about SCX. how to tune. SCX, but yeah. If you, but if you, if, if one of the manufacturers, for example, NSO or, or uh, Slotted, made a magnet holder in their cars that you could relocate to different places and you could use a grub screw to lift it, so that you could you could get it exactly right. Then we're talking about you know proper tuning using magnets, but no magnet cars have that. And that's why, yeah. you know, in my mind, that's why that whole thing is consigned to the, the toy bin. It's not serious tuning. Rich, well, tuning uh, Alan, the uh, S the SCX brand, their cars do have the adjustable mm -hmm. magnet holder where you can raise them and lower them to, to the track. Those are the only ones that I know that do. So I don't know if they like our BRZ. Yeah. Carrera, Carrera has adjustable height magnets as well. Yeah, a little floating one in the middle of the chassis, don't they? Yeah. Take the rear one off and just run the floating one. They stopped doing the that. The old Jaguars used to have the uh, the bracket, didn't they? The metal bracket yeah. with a magnet stuck on it. The old uh, Scalectrix LM uh, Le Mans cars. Do you remember mm -hmm. the Jaguar yes. and the Porsche? Yeah, that metal. Like yeah. I, but still, I that mean, that was just because you could bend it. <laughs> I mean, that's still we're still talking about. I mean, the cars that do have that. I mean, SCX is a good example. Most of their cars had adjustable magnet just by screwing in or unscrewing the screws that hold the magnet, and you could turn it. You could turn the magnet holder around so that it would screw up even further into the chassis so that it was less and less. That's like the only company that did that consistently. The Carrera one with the sliding magnet, they stopped doing that years ago. You can't, they don't make cars with that anymore. They used to, and, and between then and now they had a shim system where, you know, you'd have magnets above or below, or you'd have shims between the magnet and the chassis so that you could, you know, remove the shims and have the magnet up higher or put the shims in and have it down lower. But they don't even do that anymore. Now it's just they're just stuck in where they are in the chassis, like Skelectric and and most Ninco and other cars do. But the the point I think Alan was making was the the hobby brands or the the, the hobbyist brands rather than the toy brands. So NSR and Scale Auto and Slot It and all those other ones, none of them have an adjustable 
or at least an easily adjustable thing. Yeah, Brian's showing off one of the ones with the shim system in there, you know, or or just remove the magnets entirely. They do give you yeah, different you options, do. front or rear, don't they? So you get a couple on scale auto, and you've got three little button magnets on the um, NSR mounts to put your, place your magnets in. But, but I was just saying, from the you, fridge. You mentioned that about, say, NSR and their three button magnets. But, you know, that's not really a serious attempt at magnet tuning. That's just to appease the toy market. And if you yeah. look what those magnets do to an NSR8689 chassis, it sinks to the track in the middle. You know, and they just, the cars are not designed to take magnets. It's an afterthought. They stick in there to keep the toy, toy buyers happy. So I'd, I'd still stand by what I said is it's not a serious tuning method. And, and that no. if, we're some, if someone like NSR were to bring out something that really focused your ability to be able to place the magnets and raise them, so you could optimize them, then you know. Yeah, but the trouble is, Alan, easy. someone may copy them. Ah, yes, somebody may. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can cure. You can cure magnets easily. Just run copper. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they become they become ballast at that point. Yeah. 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 For sure. I mean, that's, you know, it, it's all the good things quick, about tuning without magnets still help a magnet car, but all the, all the things that come into play when you have to try to tune the magnet downforce, just, it's yeah. such a pain in the ass. Heating them up, what? shimming them, uh, making them bigger or smaller, tuner magnets where you, t where you drop tiny little circle magnets on top of the bar magnet to, to give it more swapping out magnets back and forth, you end up breaking the stinking magnet clips. So then you have to start using compounds to hold the magnet in. And then you're like, okay, well now, now I'm stuck with this magnet because I had to glue it in so it doesn't come out and stick to my motor during the race. You know, all, all these things are just such a pain in the butt. It's, it's true. But great, oh, it's there is it on the fridge. Simple, <laughs> take it out, put it on the fridge. What were you gonna say, Mike? Turn the power um, down. It, I think it's, it's relative, and it is one way of equalizing cars that have different chassis. Um, if you're if you're careful with it, and if you have cooperative people that you're working with, I mean, if you get one guy that wants to dominate and just hold the the uh, the trigger down, um, it, that's that's different. But if you've got cooperative people that are that are going to use magnets appropriately, you can change the tuning of different cars to equalize them. And it, it's just another method. You know, you, you say that it's a pain in the ass to do the magnets. I agree with you in that regard, but is it less a pain, a pain in the ass than really fussing with rubber tires that um, have to be polished and you can't get them down to uh, a normal, well, a smaller size to get the ground clearance correct? Uh, suspension, all that stuff that, that, that people do without it and then moving weight around the same way it's just a different methodology of tuning it in my view i think i think the point what what i when i started the conversation i i meant to to put an emphasis on when when you're having a real competition i mean yeah you guys are competing with your cars sure uh, it's it's you're more you're just doing it more for fun right you yes. made, you just said when guys want to win right so when you have yeah. a real when you have a competition with a bunch of competitive guys and you have rules in place you know so that they can't just put a mosler with 400 grams of magnetic downforce on the track and hold the trigger yes i think it's boring as hell to just hold the trigger and watch your car go around but for some guys whose ultimate goal is to win at all costs that's how that's how they have their fun is to hold the trigger and watch the car go around as long as they're crossing the line ahead of everybody else. That's their yeah. that's, that's how they derive joy from from the hobby. And so, in order to have a competition with guys like that, you have to have a limit. And when you have a limit, you have to have a methodology of verifying that they have not exceeded that limit. And then you you're now you're into tuning with magnets, and that's you're not going to have 
Carreras against Skelextric gets against Slotitz in that kind of a competition because it's going to be it's it's going to be a you know spend to win. You're, you're going to buy the fastest car and the fastest motor and the most magnets and and yada yeah. yada. They're not going to spend a whole lot of time, you know, truing tires to get the exact clearance necessary. They're just going to slap a magnets in there and 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 hold the <clears throat> and watch it go around. Greg, Greg, honestly, what I would say is for people who want to run it like that, just let them put in as many magnets as they want and let them have their fun. You're yeah, yeah. not going to be able to equalize it. You're not going to be able to get anything resembling a competition. It's not, yeah. it's not going to work. Exactly. But, but there is something that you mentioned that kind of delves into a dirty, dark secret that most people who race plastic tracks know about, and that's the flux leakage from the motors. Yeah. Yep. You know, Peter Motors. Right? Because <laughs> We don't talk about it, especially as non-magnet racers, right? And I'm a non-magnet <laughs> racer. You mean especially it. the holier than thou ones? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the holier than most Just a little the jam. The, the but the, of the, the a lot of motors, we, we have manufacturers <clears throat> who let their motors leak flux a lot. Yeah. And when you've got that, especially if you've got, well, NSR Kings leak, the, the Scale Auto SC series leak. And if you can optimize that, then you've got a huge advantage. And I'll admit that I do that. And the way that I go about doing that is to get the motor height just right off the track. And it has to be different for Ninko, for Carrera, for Scaly Sport, because all of them have different raised or dropped uh, rails. And I use that by building the car on shims to make sure that I get the motor exactly right. You know, so you know, here I am sneering about magnet races, but I will completely fess up here and now that every bit of flux leak which I can get out of a motor, I will. And the it's same challenge is there. You cannot, you cannot marshal that. You cannot um, enforce uh, a downforce yeah. limit. You can only enforce, say. No, net, no rare earth magnets in a in a, a motor, but it's very, very difficult to, to scrutineer that kind of thing. No, it's not. Well, we, got, we got a magnet marshal in, in, in my analog club. There is always a Correct. magnetic uh, downforce limit, and it always accounts for the motor. Um, the, the motor is specced in, in, the, in the series spec. It's, you know, what kind of motor are you allowed to have? And if it's an open motor, then we usually have some kind of downforce limit. So people aren't putting in king motors when they can run other motors without the crazy downforce. And the first thing, the first night of racing, we, we put every car on the scale, we eliminate the weight, and then we drop it down and see what kind of pull the magnets are, uh, what the motor is getting. And if right. it's pulling more than the allowed downforce, you're disqualified. Go put a different motor in because you're, you're, you're cheating. In our, under our rules, you're cheating. Now, if I was in a club where they're not measuring that and it's beneficial, I would be doing the same thing. That's that's natural. That's that's why you have to. If you have a limit, you have to you have to enforce it, and you to yep. enforce it, you have to measure it. One of the things I'd always say about scrutineering cars, though, Greg, is when you enforce a rule, you have to have tools that people can use at home. So if you say the car can't be wider than 63 mil. Everybody can get calipers, you get them off eBay, cheap as hell. You can't have a car that weighs less than 70 grams. Everybody can get one of those drug dealer digital scales, five quid off eBay. But if we're talking about something specific like a magnet marshal, or we're talking yeah. about something specific like an RPM meter, you know, everyone should be able to have access to the tools to set the cars up at home shouldn't have to turn up at the club and then someone says, oh, that's got too much downforce, that's revving too high. That's, you know, that's not a viable way to run a club. No, and that's why, that's why the motors are usually specced in, in the racing, in the series spec, because if you, if you say stock motor and, and you're running a slotted, you know, series and everybody, all the cars come with orange end bells, or maybe they'll say, you know, slotted orange end bell or whatever yeah. the case may be. Then you're then you're fairly certain that the that you're going to be getting under a certain amount, and we usually say let's say for example we're we're running that Group C series with orange end bell cars, you drop half a dozen cars onto the magnet marshal and they're all pulling nine or ten grams. We'll set the limit at fifteen, just to make sure that if somebody doesn't somebody comes in with a fluke of a motor that's pulling fourteen or fifteen, 
they're not going to be disqualified because you're right. Magnet marshals are expensive tools. You can do a home DIY magnet marshal thing, but it's not going to have the same readings as the magnet marshal that the club uses. But absolutely. I mean, if, if we were doing some kind of, you know, run what you brung, then we would, or put in whatever motor you wanted, you know, or just uh, uh, an RPM value of a motor, use whatever motor you wanted within that RPM value, then yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to enforce that without. Yeah. But it's not, it's not just the motor, you can spec the motor. I mean, alluded to earlier was how high it is off the track okay. and yep. tire sizes, and that has more effect than the motor you choose. So yeah. you can choose a yeah. low downforce magnet motor, if you get it close enough to the rails without shorting the rails, you'll get much more downforce than a king motor that's two mil above the track. So again, it's really difficult for me to kind of think about turning up to a race meeting where I, you know my cars are going to be subjected to tests that I have no potential to test at home. So it's it's a it's difficult territory. Do you not have clearance rules, Alan? Do you not have uh, clearance? Not at the clubs I race at, no. There is a clearance rule, Alan. The clearance rule racing, obviously, I, I know um, Alan quite well and obviously know, know the clubs he races at. The clearance rule is no scraping of the track. Yeah. So whoever runs a club, if your car's going fairly quick and it's scraping, you won't be able to use it. Right. So, so there you, you go. You, you can't. Wheels on the back of it, raise it up a bit, and you know, off you go again. Right. And and there are certainly guys who who will true down their rear tires in your know, in the club that that do everything they can to to reach that. But they also know if they don't have a magnet marshal, they also know that coming to the club if they're if they drop their car on and it's it's well above the limit that they're going to have to go put on some different tires and they just wasted a whole lot of time truing down tires. Right. I mean, a, a simple clearance rule is um, at, at, at the commercial tracks that, that I'm, or the commercial track we're running now in, in the series, I just give everybody a piece of 16th inch piano or a six inch piece. If it slides under your car, you're legal. If it doesn't, you're not. Yeah. Um, so it's a three cent uh, tool that works for everybody. Um, now, but you say that, but that three cent tool will go under the car at the start of an endurance race. And after half an hour, the tires are worn down, the springs are loosening up, the chassis is bending down and it, it's not. So, you know, exactly where in the race are we picking the cars up and scrutineering them? It's, oh, well, it's a really well, it's difficult. I get that. But at, at the start of the race, like in the start of, you go to a uh, world championship wing car, everything's at the start of the race. You have to have this, 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 and this. The tires do wear. Most of the guys are on similar tires, which will have similar wear over the race. There will be some differences, but it's more similar. Um, that's one of the one of the funny things I think about European racing is basically no magnet magnet racing. Um, they're all magnet racers. Um, I'm I'm quite I'm quite surprised that you guys aren't running neo magnet motors um, or dig out some old MB slot dodo motors and just kick the hell out of everybody. Yeah, not allowed. Yeah, but the I thing mean, is, no Chris, promotion. most of the club racing in the UK is actually on wood tracks, mate. So. Yeah, and it's got copper tape, so that's it. You, your magnets are screwed for a start. Yeah, there's more racing on wood, Chris, than plastic in the UK, no, mate. I, I get that, but I mean, there's still, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of the design parameters behind Thunderslot and NSR are based on plastic trackers. Yeah. yeah, well, exactly, you know. Um, Where's the advantage, you know? Um, Where's the advantage of get more motor closer to the track rails, get more magnet traction out of it. Right. Um, you know, look at the Thunderstock wheels. What are they? 14.8, a millimetre smaller than a 15.8 slot it, so or a 16 mil NSR. So um, I know what you're saying. Um, Gary um, introduced the um, Scale Auto Sponge tyres in the just disc of GT3, uh, and we run a 1.8 mil ride height. So, you know, at the start of the race, um, you know, so we do 
lift them up. Um, I know what you're saying, but, you know, sometimes I find no newer tyres are better than worn tyres. A bit more top speed, you've got better grip. So, you haven't got the magnet traction, but, you know, each their own, isn't it? No, at, well, absolutely. And, and we're, admittedly, I'm not sure how common it is, but it, it, talking to you guys, it feels fairly uncommon. The, the analog club that I race with is about half copper, you know, taped wood track and about half plastic track. So we're constantly going back and forth, basically. In, in fact, at this point, we have pretty much half and half. So they, they set the series schedule so that we're going plastic wood, plastic wood, plastic wood, plastic wood. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> we can't just say, well, if it, it, it's okay for the magnet to be in there because it's just ballast for the wood tracks and then <laughs> run on the plastic tracks. No, no, we have to basically treat See, I would I want to be racing wood much more often, but I think I'm just gonna to have to move to Oxford to do that. Just pick yeah, up just my move, <laughs> move to Somerset, Alan. Move yeah. to Somerset. And I've got one in my back garden. Okay. I've got the old I've got the old Timaru track in my garage. Fantastic. But I mean I much as I enjoy racing on plastic tracks, I mean it's all good. But I uh, I enjoy different tracks and the challenge of wood is completely different. And, you know, and it takes away any of that sort of dirty tricks with the magnet traction from the motor. Uh, and it gives you a different perspective of how to tune the car. Who are you showing off there, Alan? Hey, say hello to the guys. Hey, that's my hello. son. Hello, then. The youngest of my three. <laughs> and he's taller than me. He's yeah. not growing. They do that. <laughs> uh, hey, as, as he should be. As he should be. It's true. Greg, you know when you you know you say you're racing wood, plastic, wood, plastic, wood, plastic. Surely, if you set the car up for your magnets on the plastic anyway, it doesn't matter on the wood, does it? No, nope. because you you won't need to need to readjust anything. You just keep running it as it is. Yeah, which is which is pretty much why we run almost all no magnets anymore i mean we used to have some magnet racing but once we had so many wood tracks it was pointless because it they don't work. perform completely different on the wood track than they do on yeah. the on the plastic track so th so then it became just no magnets all the time so that it was cars perform the same and the uh, the scale auto sponge tires are fantastic they they perform well on scale electric sport they perform great on wood of course and they just perform great on just about everything you put them on so these days we run pretty much all non-magnet, you know, with like 15 or lower grams downforce maximum, uh, scale auto foam tires or NSR type rubber N22, you know, slotted N22 or A19. So super grippy tires that, that hook up on pretty much anything. And it doesn't really matter. The cars run great. Yeah. On the tracks. What, do you, what do you find better, wood or plastic? Uh, a, a well done plastic track is good, but wood, duh. I mean, that's. I was going to say, you, got, you better say wood. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no, there's, I don't think anybody who's driven on both plastic and wood would say that, that yeah. wood is not better. Yes. I think we can all say that we've ridden on some really good plastic tracks and on some really bad wood tracks. Right. <laughs> that's right. yeah. that's but, fair. I've, yeah. I've driven on some bad wood tracks. But in, gen but in general, in general. The, the driving experience on a, on a wood track is, uh, well, it's just smoother usually. Um, the fact that you can get a deeper guide helps. The fact that you have uh, fewer connections and uh, interfaces for the electricity to worry about, uh, you, you, know, you just get better power all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. I take I, I run my cars on my track, which is a wood track, <clears throat> and I, I take them to the shop and run on that six lane Paula car track. And I swear I've changed the motors like I'm going what what what's gone wrong with my car on the plastic track it won't go. I take it home and put it on a braided track and the car is totally different. The one advantage in general that plastic tracks do have is that every single day you can make a new layout. Yeah. End of story. That's it. That's the only good Well, and yeah, you can make a new layout, plus the fact that um, 
it's not very easy to incorporate digital into a wood track. No, it's it's no, it's not easy. It it is more difficult, but it, it certainly can be done. Oh, um, Lee Thorne Dykes just put some the you know the your lane changes you have on digital. He's just put some of them on a wood track. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've seen the methodology there for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking and, about doing my red lane. On my red lane, it's the outside lane as it comes through the start line and goes past the pits. I was thinking about doing the old changer to go into the pits so I can drive one car into the pits, stop it in sections, and then isolate those sections and still have a through road going through. And I was thinking, eh, eh, no, nah, sorry, that can't be asked. <laughs> yeah, I was Mike, asking your dad... Mike, I've got nothing against plastic tracks whatsoever. We've, we've just no. put a six-lane um, polar car, 135-foot polar car track into the shop. And I've, I've had way more plastic tracks over my life than I ever had wood tracks. Um, but since I am not a digital racer, um, if you said to me, you know, pick, I would pick wood. It, it, it's for what I want to do, it is unquestionably better. I, I don't downplay anyone who has a plastic truck whatsoever. Chris, why did you go for Polycar instead of Carrera? Uh, because we, um, Ernie Mazzetti, who owns Mr. Slot Car, we've, we've known um, Maurizio for years and years and years. So we got 135 feet of Polycar track, six lanes for um, not very much money. <laughs> it fell off the back of a lorry. <laughs> well, Maurizio sent a bunch of stuff. He's, we, I, I was up I, all week. I've been um, playing with the new G25, or the last couple of weeks I've been playing with G25 tires. Uh, Maurizio sent us three or 400. That's going to be the spec tire we're going to run on the Policar track. So I've been gluing and truing G25s for a couple of weeks now. What's your feeling? Or what, what's your opinion of that tire? Uh, for Paul, uh, Maurizio designed it specifically for the Policar track. For the Policar track, it's it's quite good. The main advantage is that when I tech the cars, if everybody's on the same tire, who cares? Like it's um, for a wood track, it is not. I don't believe it's as good as the uh, F22s or N22s. Um, but it was never intended to be a wood track um, tire. Okay, but you haven't tried it on, on wood yet. I have tried it on my own track down. Yes, I have. Okay. Um, I, I still wouldn't go away from um, what you're using or the NSRs. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a more, it's, it's a little less, the, the G25s are a little bit more abrasion resistant. Yeah, well, it's a 25 sure rather than a 22 yeah, or an 18 which, anyway, right? Which for the, the bloody Policar track, which is like a, a bloody emery board, you, you need something with a little, you know, more abrasion resistance. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, it's just I have a couple of sets. I just wondered Easy. how they're going to work. Yeah, I mean, being 25 sure, they, they true nice. Um, I haven't gooped them up a lot. I'm sure if you bathe them in your favorite solution for a while, you can probably make the 25 a little gummier and softer, but- um, Dude, I don't even bathe myself in my favorite solution. I put it inside. <laughs> it shows. No, no, my favorite solution goes in, right in here. I think he's gonna catch fire. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're going to be the, the G25s are going to be great for us because we're going to mandate that as a spec rubber tire. Um, but there's no there's no identification on the tire though, is it? No. But, apart from apart from the mold number, which may be unique. Yeah, the mold, the the guys that are going to be racing on the plastic track at uh, Race World. I'm not worried that too many. <laughs> they're going to come in and go, I'll take three sets of tires already trued and I'll put them on my car and that, that's going to be just fine. Yeah, I think it's, I think it has a slightly different mold number. Yeah. What do you think was the deal between the performance of your car when you put it on the Policar track, you said it felt like there was a motor change or something. 
Do you think uh, it just just based on I mean, regardless of how many power taps you do, I mean, you need a ton of power taps and a, a braided surface with one or two power taps. It just, the power is just, the current is that flows through is just awesome. Um, you know, you, you can go around tracks and, and check for voltage drops and, you know, you don't find any, but that's only half the story. Um, you know, you can, you can put your tongue quite successfully on a little nine volt, one of those little square flashlight battery things. If you found a nine volt motorcycle battery or a boat battery and try and stick your tongue on that, see if you'd be in for a big surprise. So it's all current based. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was thinking. How many power taps are on that long ass track that we got? Uh, we put one every uh, 10 joins. Wow. Wow. You, you, you think that 10 joins wouldn't be enough to be noticeable? Well, you'd think or, that. I, but I, no, I, 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 I get it. I mean, I, I notice power drops in other guys' tracks that they don't notice. And I'm always yeah. surprised. How do you not? feel that power loss well i can um and again i'm sort of when i say it seems like i change motors uh, if, if i put my cars on my track which is a braided routed track with with like a 60 amp power supply um and i take it to the polycar track there is unquestionably no doubts whatsoever a difference in response and power um it's just there now, most guys, a lot of guys don't feel it. I think it's too much. Um, yeah. But. I mean, that's why that's why I soldered every joint on this track. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I get it. I get it. I get it totally. I would not want, I mean, it was enough work for, for 50, 50 feet of two lane. I would not want to be doing 100 feet of, what was it, six lane or eight? What? 130 feet of six lane. 135 feet, six lanes. Oh, hell no. No. No, lots, even lots, no. lots of soldering on sections for power tops. Mm -hmm. I do tell you, I notice it a lot more when I do take some of my vintage cars that have like a 26, like a higher current drum motor. Yeah. I really notice it then. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. That's kind of what I think. And what power supplies is that six lane? Has it got individual supplies for each lane or? No, no, one that's got a, um, uh, on that, it's because it's a plastic track, we don't need too much. It's a 50 amp power supply. Yeah, that should be plenty. So, well. I mean, you're not running wind cars on it. But... Yeah, you can't have too many amps. Yeah, <laughs> there's no such thing as too many amps, but no. at the same time, you're not running wind cars on it. It's, it's still going to be, you know, normal, not speed straight morons cars. Well, with, with some of the wing cars, you need 60 amps per lane. <laughs> per lane, yeah. <laughs> Greg, you were mentioning earlier that you take cars that you race on plastic track and then you make some adjustments to make you change the tires and run them on wood and no, everything looks okay. No? Nope. No. I oh, make okay. Adjustments. I mean, the only it's... adjustment I make is to the braid. So on, the, so on sport track, I do the twist and bring them in tight. And on the other tracks, I, I, you know, spread them out so that they get. Okay. Other than that, this this, uh, this speaks to a subject that I've got. I can't even use the same cars that I race on one plastic track on another plastic track. I, you know, never mind a wood track. So if I'm racing, if I've got a club, I go to a club that uses scaly spool that's painted. I have a set of cars that are optimized for that track, and then my other club is the Ninko track. I mean, it's different. The, the rails are raised. The surface is more abrasive. That's different. And uh, if I was going to race a wood track, I'd really start to evolve a, you know, a set of cars to race optimally on that wood track. Yes. And even the wood tracks, they have different braid, uh, braided surfaces, rails. Uh, there's one venue up in Milton Keynes race halls. They have tracks, and the tracks all seem to have a slightly different amount of recess. Right. down to the braided rails. So that means that even for the different tracks in that same venue, to optimize your car, you need different amounts of washers underneath your guide. Right. So I sort of 
I've completely well, given up on the idea of having a car that I can set up and then transport around different tracks. I've just never made that work. Yeah. So the so the it's, rules of our most of our race series are, are you have to run the same car from start to finish. So so you can't you can't set up multiple cars or multiple chassis or or keep keep changing out your setup significantly. You can you can reconfigure your braids, which is pretty much all we really need to do. So I guess you would want to treat if you were to come and race at our club, if you were to just stay in the area and want to race at our club. You would want to set your car up more like you would for a proxy, where where it's going to go around yeah. multiple tracks. You you're not allowed to change it between tracks, other than you know fixing the braid to 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 properly contact whatever track you're on. Okay, uh, Greg, if to play to to come back at you a little bit on that, um, I've got a front, I've got adjustable front axle blocks. And on one track, I'm racing on a scale electric sport track with slightly proud rails. And on my next track, I'm going on to a routed track with slightly recessed rails. How are you going to determine that I haven't changed the front right height? We don't get that. We don't get quite that. Uh, I don't want okay. to. Okay, no, no, which, which is fine. We don't, we don't go that deep into the tech. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Fine, back to Alan's point. Um, on all of the tracks, Alan, that we run in our clubs and commercials, so there's probably about 15 tracks. And I have probably about three or four different setup blocks with different recess uh, levels ground into them. Come on, Because um, you will need to do a different setup for each individual track. Yeah, I mean, I won't. I won't claim that any any of the cars in our racing club is optimized for any specific track. Like one of the track, a couple of the tracks are routed with braid, so they're you know the braids are slightly inset, you know, and, and yep. you want a different setup, like you were saying. Some of the wood tracks are just copper taped. Yep. Uh, fortunately, most of the plastic is Scalextric Sport, so we don't have any Carrera or Ninko uh, or Polycar yet tracks to worry about but for the most part the same car will run on all of them just by fixing up the braid but you're right with the, we do often run series where those adjustability those the ability to make those adjustments is is by nature part of the car and someone yeah. could absolutely say oh well we're racing on alan's track you know i'll go ahead and drop that guy a little by raising the front axle or whatever they want to do and nobody would notice or care yeah, no, no. My, my, my comment was back to Alan, actually, in that, yes, um, and uh, Dennis, every single different track that Dennis runs on, all of his guys change the ride height and change a bunch of things for every weighting, tires, everything for track specific. So, yes, Alan, if you're running on Ninko track or wood track or scale electric sport track or Carrera or painted Carrera, there are things that you likely should do between tracks to get the maximum performance. So one, one, one car does not, one car you can take and drive around on a whole bunch of tracks and have some fun and watch it go around and have a beer and it's all going to be great. Um, if you're serious about it, you're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. yeah. And what, what I think we would say about that is that it, it's, it, what I've found is that every time I lose some components on our car and change the rear track, raise the guide, loosen and tighten the body, the components all seem to not go back together as nicely as when the car was first built. Mm -hmm. So my approach has been definitely to get a car optimal for a track that I want it to be on, and then I leave it alone. I don't like to mess with it. Yep. really don't like to even take the body off if I can avoid it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, here's a great story. To, I, this will probably take me five or 10 minutes. So I'll just tell this story for, for the last. So, so Monday was our first race of this series. We we're running Spirit uh, Dallara. I don't, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, LMP cars. And uh, I am, I don't enjoy tuning. I know how to do some stuff. And obviously you guys have taught me a lot more, but I don't enjoy it as much as I used to. So generally speaking, I will just leave the car box stock. You know, if the motor turns around and the wheels go, I'll slap it on the track and see how it does. 
So that's what happened on Monday. I brought my car, slapped it on the track. It went around okay. It was a little noisy, you know, but it, but it went. And so that's how I started the race night. Uh, and then like one heat after my first, after my first heat, I'm like, okay, well, it's not running as well as the other guys' cars. All their cars are much quieter than my car. I don't generally care about noise, but as you know, that usually is an indication of, of some performance <laughs> being lost. So <sighs> I took a closer look at it and I noticed that my front wheels were, were not spinning freely because by driving it, they had pinched inward and were not freely spinning anymore. So I fixed that. Uh, after the next heat, I'm like, okay, well, this is making way too much noise. So I'll go ahead and loosen some screws. Uh, and the, the car does not come with good screws. It's basically just a bunch of self-tapping screws that are way too short for their own good. So, but I just backed them off like half a turn or, or, or a turn or so and put the car back on. And it was much quieter, though still not nearly as quiet as the other guys' cars. And it seemed to be running a little bit better. And then a couple heats later, a guy picks up my car to put it on the track for the next for my next heat. And the body was flopping off. And I'm like, oh, crap, I lost this, one of the body screws. So we had to find the body screw. Fortunately, that was quick to find. But that means that I can't have the body screws loose at all because then they'll just fall out. So I'm like, OK, well, tuner screws are allowed. Tuners are what we call the, the little brass ones with the flat heads and the, 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 the smooth shaft. So I went over, I had tuner screws. I just didn't bother putting them in. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll go put the tuner screws in just to, do, just to do that, right? So that I didn't lose screws onto the track on my next heat or two. And I swapped out tuner screws and then just have them, you know, back off a, you know, a half a turn or so, barely any float, but then I put the car back on and it was it was dreamy. It was just quiet and it was more stable than it had been. And I, at no point had I added any weight, had I put it on a setup block and done all the, the wheelie pushies and all that stuff. <clears throat> and it, it was, it was remarkable how such a small, cause it changed considerably between loose stock screws and slightly loosened tuner screws, just because of the smooth shaft, presumably where where it's where it's going yeah. through the chassis and the pod, uh, and you know maybe a little bit of extra play because the the heads on the the stock screws were so much bigger. They're basically taking up the entire uh, screw head, you know, recess. Uh, and then from then on, I'm like, okay, yeah, it was it was great. <laughs> was so come on in. Are we going to actually see? what your paint job was because last oh, week you said you... I was hoping to get away with it <laughs> no you said last week you're going to bring it in and show us you just squeezed in in the last seven minutes I got it in didn't I, I <laughs> alright so remember I do not enjoy painting let me turn sharing on for myself you, you, you just confirmed what Chris always says where you know less is more yeah <laughs> Everybody lean in for a good look. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna flash it up so you better be watching. No. Yeah. I was I was going we for grab. Oh look, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna suddenly run out of time, aren't we? Uh, no, I got it. I was I was going for a specific look, but it did not work out. And I just said fuck it. <laughs> oh that looks good. Oh, it's not bad. That's, um, oh, man. Yeah. The colors. I, I appreciate it, but yeah, you're, you guys are all fine, not your teeth. No, no, no. But it, no, that's actually no, pretty cool. You use a marker, right? Really like a couple of wiggly lines, but you can get away with it. The wiggly lines obviously were on purpose because that was the look I was going for. I wanted it to look like it, I basically wanted it to look like it hit a bucket of paint. At, so or what? Or yeah. hit a bucket of blue paint. What part did you paint and which part did your granddaughter paint? <laughs> all of it is that or a roller Greg if it passes the six foot test at 30 miles per hour it's it was good. a car that went around the track and it's blue and yellow so it fit all of my check boxes nicely and, and you've got the perfect number because it's the same upside down exactly yeah. which is why I put the one on the back here exactly sideways right <laughs> so you, made a, you made an art you made an art car you made yeah. it 
exactly. I was I was hoping it would be more art than that, but then I like the, the funny thing is is that I should have done what I thought <coughs> I shouldn't have done, which was I I painted it yellow, and I'm thinking, okay, I want to I want to give it a splattered blue paint look, like it hit a bucket of blue paint, and so I go to to uh, decant some of my blue paint so that I could use a brush to do it. And it was coming out all spittily because it had caked on some paint. And I'm like, well, maybe I should just spray the, no, because that'll look terrible if I just spray the car with the spittily paint. So I did it by hand. And then obviously I'm thinking, yeah, I should have just gone ahead and used the spittily paint can spray. And <laughs> Oh, that's all. No, it's awesome. Warhol would be proud. <clears throat> you still can. You still can. I still can't, except I had to, it, I, I decanted all that paint. So now that that can is gone. So it doesn't spittle. Anymore. I don't have that paint to spittle on it. Then I thought maybe I'd use some more blue paint to, to kind of turn them into ugly blue flames. But then I decided that I would do that badly. So it looked even more bad and decided to quit while I was. I had an idea. Hand grenade in a bucket. Yeah, de decant that blue paint into your mouth and go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> use a toothbrush. Dip so, the toothbrush in and flick the bristles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that, and I did not do a very good way. But you know, <laughs> what I ended up doing is holding the holding the car ver the body vertically, right? and then putting way too much paint so it would drip down. But this I was, was say, it looks like it naturally did drip. It it didn't though. It since it was the spray paint, it cures fairly quickly. It doesn't want to drip, oh. so I ended up swinging it around. <laughs> putting a block of paint on it and swinging it around to get it to drip better, which gave me a couple of nice splatters in a couple of spots, but generally it was just- You should have just let it hang like a lump of snot to hit it. It just wouldn't, I would put a blob of paint on, a big old dollop that would drop off the brush. And as soon as it hit the car, it would just kind of go a little bit and then stop. If, if your track was up, you could have created, you could have put it on the track and run it around the track and do a little, like, like a Flomax thing. <laughs> Put it in a tumble dryer. Oh. Well, there's a there's a YouTube video of a guy. Granted, it's with um, with a vacuum form body where he sticks the body onto the end of his electric drill with a oh jeez, oh, hang on, and, and just swings it around with the drill. <laughs> uh, that probably would have worked, but of course this yeah, was all sorry. Done, some guy went by with a lawnmower. This was all done literally on Sunday yeah. for a race. Yeah, yeah, Sunday. I think it looks great. I like it. Oh, we yeah. used to do that a lot. Or just take a, put a piece of masking tape on a on a piece of glass or something. Take a take a um, a knife and just wiggle like that, and then pick that piece up, and you get these, you get the, and then stick those on somehow. For the mask, I did I did lots of masking like that at one stage. All my cars are masked. The, in fact, the creepy, the creepy crawly ones were the best to do that because that they they used exactly that on some of their some of their cars. Those kind of wobbly stripes. The, the yeah, saddest part was that I had this car kit for literally the entire pandemic. I've had this car kit sitting on my bench, knowing that it would eventually be a series with our club, and I still waited until the last freaking day to do it. The last minute. It's the paint so you, dry. You, you basically. You Almost. fibbed to it because you said it was rubbish and what you created is something that should be in the Tate Modern. We've yeah. even got the artist background <laughs> story. Right? So yeah. come on. Yeah, looking Greg, great. I have to see that's that's a sign of a true artist. Yeah. Pro yeah. Procrastination. And be on eBay next first. week, six hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Spirit made a LMP almost had that same color scheme. And, and, and very similar. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It was uh actually it was this, this was a spirit car, by the way. See that one? Yeah, I have that car. I have that car. <laughs> I would have I would have just put that body on my car, except that that's an Orica and then the Delara body is not the same. It yeah. didn't actually fit. I have that. I would have absolutely loved to drive that car instead, for sure. Well, now, now you could do now is get a spare body and copy that. Because all you got to do is take that blue bit out the middle and tape it up with masking tape. I, I, the one thing that I like about my paint job was that uh, it looks kind of like the Delta wing because I, I made the, the those side pods of the front wheels blue. So the yellow looks like a Delta wing. I'm like, oh, I should have done. So I should have focused on that. But yeah, no, it's not going to happen. You know, 
<laughs> gonna, I might go dig up some decals and just throw a bunch of random sponsorship decals on there. Just to put Seneca on the wing. Seneca and Bill Stein and you know all kinds of things. But yeah. Anyways, that's the end of our recording. So I'm gonna hit stop. Everybody wave bye bye, and we'll see you next time. Bye. bye.